This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 102 was recorded January 25th, 2018. I'm Eric Townsend. Artemis Capital founder Chris Cole will be joining me as this week's feature interview guest, and you're not going to want to miss this one, folks. Chris is one of the most informed voices in the industry when it comes to equity volatility, and he's going to put the short vol trade that you've heard so much about in a whole new light. Be sure not to miss Chris's chart book. The download is available in your Research Roundup email. Be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment after the feature interview when Patrick and I will compare notes on trading strategies that benefit from Chris Cole's outlook for equity volatility. And I'm Patrick Serezna. Now, Eric, the S&P 500 once again this week ripped to all-time new highs and has been sort of consolidating since. Uh, what's your take here on the markets? Well, you know, it's been more than 24 hours since we had a new all-time high. Is that a new record? <laughs> Is that the new rules these days? I don't really see this much differently than what I've described for the last several weeks. We're in the late stages of a bull market. One thing I would say, I've seen a lot of people on Twitter that are getting kind of befuddled about, you know, how come the RSI is at this number and it didn't hold and whatever. Remember that if I'm right, and we are in that final euphoria stage of a bull market, that's when technical analysis tends to go out the window and it's really just sentiment and momentum that takes over. The market keeps going up because people many times first time investors are rushing in fear of missing out syndrome and it just takes things higher regardless of what the RSI or any other technical indicator might be doing. I don't think that I would want to be long or short this market right now. If you're going to play the upside or the downside, I do it with options because I think we're in that very, very difficult to time stage where there could be another thousand points of upside on the S&P, or it could roll over tomorrow and there could be a tragic event to the downside. It's a question of when the catalyst comes along to change investor sentiment. We don't have it yet, but you never know what might happen. So I think the key is play it with options. And for anyone who might have missed it, you did an excellent webinar. I had time this past weekend to tune in, quite enjoyed that. For anybody who missed it, they can go to bigpicturetrading.com and it's still possible, I think, to get the playback of the webinar that you did on the ratio call spread, which is an excellent way if you want to play this market to the upside to use options in order to manage your downside risk. All right, let's move on. Now, you wanted to do things a little differently this week because you wanted to combine the outlook on the dollar, gold, and treasury bonds all into a single topic. Now, the dollar index was holding that 90 level, and when that support line gave, uh, we dropped almost two full points down to the towards the bottom end of 88 in very short order. I mean, there was so very heavy selling on the dollar. What's on your mind there? Well, I wanted to take the three of these things together because they're interrelated in a very complex way, and I'll be the first to admit that I don't fully understand what the heck is going on right now. First of all, I've been predicting for months on this program that if we saw a clean downside break below 91 on the dollar index, that it would accelerate to the downside. Now, needless to say, when the Treasury Secretary of the United States announces to the world that a weak dollar is a good thing, that certainly helps it to the downside. Of course, now President Trump came out today and said that uh, Mr. Mnuchin was misunderstood and misinterpreted that the low U.S. dollar is a good thing. That didn't really mean it or something. I'm not sure. The point is, you see this kind of downside acceleration on the dollar. What I was predicting was that gold would take off to the upside. The other thing is, of course, there's a relationship between treasury yields and the dollar. What you would expect is that if treasury yields were going to trend to the downside in yield up in price, that would tend to support a weak dollar situation. On the other hand, if treasury yields are increasing in yield, that attracts international capital, and that should be supportive of the U.S. dollar. So it doesn't really make sense to have 
Treasury yields going up at the same time as the dollar is going down. Now, for years, I've been predicting that exact scenario of Treasury yields up and dollar down as a signpost to indicate that we're really in the end game for the U.S. dollar. But frankly, if that's what were going on, you would see just massive upside in gold as everybody was panicking out of the dollar. So what's really perplexing to me, Patrick, is first of all, the move in the dollar doesn't really jive with the move that we've seen now up to, I think it was, a I don't know what the high yield was. I don't think we hit 2.7%, but certainly 267, 268, I think I saw on the 10-year yield this week. That's a pretty steep yield to have the dollar collapsing. And the thing is, gold, yeah, it's up, but it's not up by very much. And once President Trump said, don't take the Secretary of the Treasury seriously when he says a weak dollar is a good thing, gold sold right off, back down to pretty close to where it was last week. So if the dollar is tanking the way it appears to be and is headed much lower, why the heck isn't gold higher? And how do we reconcile what's going on with treasuries? My contention, Patrick, is something doesn't add up here. We're seeing a false signal somewhere. Something's got to bounce back, and I'm not sure what. Is this a false head fake in the dollar, and the dollar is going to fake everybody out with one last bottom and then go rocketing to the upside? Is gold just slow to react? Is this a head fake on higher treasury yields and we're actually going to move to lower treasury yields and gold is going to move up? Uh, I don't know, but these three things don't add up in the motions that we've seen this week. And I'm waiting for uh, something to give to indicate what's going on. All right. Well, let's move on to crude oil. Crude oil just broke out once again to a fresh new high, giving a little bit of a back right now as we go into uh, today's close. But what's your thinking here on crude? Well, I said last week that we were on the cusp of a reversal to the downside, and we were. We got a reversal to the downside for all of two bucks down to the 13-day moving average, touched it exactly, and reversed higher. And the 13-day is not at all a a, a big correction. That's one of the very short-dated moving averages. That's about as small as a correction can get and still be called a correction, and then moved higher. Inventory this week, crude oil drawing down one 1.1 1.1 million barrels. Remember, though, we're seasonally at the time of year when we should be seeing builds on inventory. So even though 1.1 million barrels is not a huge drawdown, any drawdown this time of year is a pretty big deal. Cushing, Oklahoma, drawing down 3.2 million barrels. That's a huge drawdown for Cushing, Oklahoma, and it's I don't know how many in a row we've had now. Keystone Pipeline spill is over. That's not affecting things, and we've had week after week after week of really big Cushing drawdown. These are all very bullish factors. Now, gasoline built 3.1 million barrels. Distillates building 639,000 barrels. Uh, It was a roller coaster on inventory. First it was up, then it was down, then it was back up again. Production up 128,000 barrels per day. Now, that's a big deal. That's a big number, and it's real this week. We had a bigger up number last week, but the number up last week was really just compensating out the fact we'd had a big drop the week before. This is actually a significant new increase to a a new high. So, you know, one week doesn't make a trend, but it looks like production's picking up. Certainly, the inventory draw, which is bullish, won out over the bearish increase in production because we saw a really big move all the way up to 66.67, right around Thursday morning's open on the New York cash session at 9 a.m. And it's been down all day. And it was really interesting, Patrick, because the resistance, the key resistance level until yesterday was 65 spot 11. Now that's the 200 month moving average. That's a, a pretty big line in the sand. Broke through it very decisively on Wednesday to the upside, moved you know more than a dollar uh, above it. And then as we got into this afternoon's close, we closed the pit session at 2.30 p.m. at 65 spot 51. That's 40 cents above that key level. But just minutes after the pit close, the market pushed all the way down, and sure enough, we tested just below 65 spot 11, which is the key number. I think the low print was 65.08. Bounced off of it up to about 65 spot 37. Then as we came into the 4 p.m. close of the uh, 
cash session where the ETFs are affecting the price of oil. We got another test, not quite down to 65.11. I think in the on that test, this low print was around 65.14, 65.15. And as we're speaking now, we're back up to 65 spot 25, just a few minutes after 4 p.m. I could easily see fireworks in either direction in the overnight session tonight, Patrick. The people who were trying to sell it below that key level and didn't get it there during the cash session may try to jerk the market lower in order to perpetrate a, a stop run this evening. Or, you know, maybe Asia wakes up and says, hey, that 6511 was key resistance yesterday. It held his support today. Time to buy like crazy and maybe we'll wake up and see 67 tomorrow. Uh, I could see 63 or 67 tomorrow morning and I wouldn't be surprised either way. The trend so far, if 65 spot 11 holds, has been strong and positive and it may continue you know you could easily make an argument for 69 or 70 dollar wti here just based on the tape action that we've seen on the other hand though you know at some point we've got this massive massive imbalance of speculative long interest 11 to 1 ratio of speculative longs to shorts all-time record of cumulative longs in energy products across the board between wti and gasoline and, and uh, the various other products heating oil and so forth at some point even OPEC is going to object to higher prices because they don't want to restart the U.S. shale revolution. I don't know what that number is, but I think we're getting close. So right now, if I look at this, if 65 spot 11 holds and we don't take it out to the downside, uh, I think that uh, $70 WTI may be in the cards. We've already seen $70 Brent. $70 WTI may be coming. On the other hand, when this does unwind, and I'm not sure when it's going to happen, it could get ugly pretty fast because of that massive speculative long interest that could start selling all at once. Everybody is on one side of the boat here, and it doesn't mean they all have to jump ship. Right now, the trend is still up, and it's strong. But when it does reverse, if everybody starts jumping ship at the same time, it could get ugly, and it could get ugly pretty fast. All right. Well, thanks for the summary, Eric. Now, this week's featured interview guest is Chris Cole, founder of Artemis Capital. Eric's interview with Chris is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me next on the program is Artemis Capital founder, Chris Cole. Chris is an expert on volatility in equity markets, and we're going to focus the interview primarily on that subject. Chris has written an excellent article called Volatility and the Alchemy of Risk, which is available in the public domain, but for your convenience, we've also linked it in your research roundup email. Also linked in your research roundup email is a slide presentation, which is not public domain, and Artemis has asked us to remind you to please observe the request on the first page that this is intended only for Macro Voices listeners. Please don't post it on the internet, forward it, or otherwise redistribute it. Chris, in the beginning of the presentation, you start with this Ouroboros, I believe it's called, which is the symbol of the snake eating itself. Tell us why you start the presentation with that particular graphic and how it relates to the market. Sure. Uh, the Ouroboros is a Greek word meaning tail devourer. And this is one of the oldest symbols in human civilization, which essentially shows a snake consuming its own body in perfect symmetry. This is actually based on a real phenomenon. In nature, when a snake becomes overheated and is unable to regulate its body temperature, it will have a spike in metabolism leading to a state of mania. And in this state of mania, the snake will look at its own tail and see it as prey and the snake will begin to self-cannibalize itself until really it dies. To me, the Ouroboros as a symbol is a metaphor for the financial alchemy driving this modern bull market. Volatility across asset classes is really at multi-generational lows, but there's now a dangerous feedback loop that exists between ultra-low interest rates, debt expansion, central bank stimulus, and asset volatility, and then financial engineering that's allocating risk based on that volatility. 
And this is re- leading into a self-reflexive loop where lower volatility feeds into lower vol. But in the event that we have the wrong type of shock to the system, I believe this can reverse violently where higher volatility then reinforces higher vol. And this, this is a, a much bigger risk in today's market environment. It's one that's not being correctly discounted. On page three, it looks like you're essentially using the snake to describe a vicious cycle of factors that feed one another. Give us the quick run through of what that cycle is and how it works before we move on to some of your more specific slides. Sure. I think we look at the global short volatility trade, and I take a very, very wide description of what I call short vol. But this now represents an estimated $2 trillion in financial engineering strategies that are exerting influence and are simultaneously influenced by stock market volatility. And this is just an equity vol. Actually, this phenomena exists in other forms of volatility. I focus on equity volatility. But It really begins with central bank stimulus. You have central banks that have created this preemptive strike on risk. There's this view that they will always be there to support markets. Uh, They've lowered interest rates to the lowest levels in the history of human civilization with data going back to the the 1200s. In some cases, even negative rates. There's almost $10 trillion worth of negative rates out there. This has led to a dynamic where there's a glut of savings. It's very difficult to get value. And corporations are finding that it's not very efficient to reinvest uh, in human capital or in CapEx. So instead of doing that, they are literally eating themselves. They are buying back their shares, leveraging, using debt to leverage, and then using that that cash to buy back their shares. This has resulted in a price-insensitive buyer that's always there to buy back the market, which has destroyed realized volatility. This has led to the outperformance of short volatility trades. It's led to the outperformance of passive funds and indexation. And it's led to the outperformance of various strategies that bet, that use financial engineering in some way to bet on market stability, introducing kind of a short gamma effect into the market. These could be strategies ranging from everything from risk parity to VAR rebalancing funds. So this is all great as long as volatility is low or dropping, as long as markets are stable. But in the event that we have a reversal in this, this $2 trillion of equity exposure, that self-reflexive driving lower vol can reverse in a, in a quite violent way. And I think this graphic we worked on, the concept and the execution was done by Brendan Wyeth, but uh, the concept that, came, that I came up with here, I think shows this in a, in a, a visual way. Now, corporate buybacks particularly interested me when I read your paper because I'm very familiar with the idea that corporate buybacks are fueling this stock market rally. But there was a couple of points that you made there that I thought were very interesting. One is that you know, equity investors just have it programmed into their minds that if you've got a trend of improving earnings per share, if EPS is in a growth trend, that can only mean that the company is making money and, in fact, its profits are improving over time. And you point out that's not really true because when companies are buying back their own shares, it effectively has this this artificial effect of increasing earnings per share because the denominator is being reduced. There's not as many shares. But that really, I think, most people don't register that. They don't realize that when earnings per share is growing, that it really doesn't necessarily mean that the company is profitable. In addition, though, you're describing that as a type of short vol trade. So how should we be thinking about short vol? Because we've done a lot of interviews in this program about the short vol trade. But frankly, we're only talking, if I move on to slide five here in your presentation, about what you're calling the explicit short vol trade, the shorting of the VIX and so forth. You're describing that that's really only a small piece of a much larger trade or a much larger trend that involves short volatility. So give us the picture of what is the overall overall extent of this short vol trade, and what does this pyramid show us on page five? Yeah, the short vol trade, if you look at short volatility and you think about what what volatility really is, it's the bet on stability. It's a bet on stability. And when you're betting on stability, that's a myriad of different bets. Part of that is the expectation that markets remain low volatility or low realized volatility. Part of that is a short gamma bet. So there's this implicit short gamma exposure. There's part of that is a bet against uh, that correlations remain stable 
or that different market relationships from, remain anti-correlated with one another and that or implied correlations are dropping or in realized correlations are dropping. And the other aspect of the short volatility bet is that interest rates remain low or go lower. So if we look at each of these different factors, these are the risk exposures that you will have when you own a portfolio of short options. If you own a portfolio of short options, you're short vega, you're short gamma, you're short correlation, you're short interest rates. Well, what we've seen now with the short vol trade, both explicitly and implicitly, is that various financial engineering strategies out there that have become dominant in the marketplace. I mean, we're talking about the largest hedge funds in the world employ these strategies that are just replicating the exposures of a short option portfolio. And of course, you know, the VIX, the VIX trade gets a lot of attention, but it's the smallest portion of the short vol trade. And this is what we call explicitly shorting volatility. This is where you're literally going out and you're shorting an option or you're shorting a volatility future. But, you know, in the VIX space, you know, that's only about $5 billion worth of short exposure. Um, you have about $8 billion in vol selling funds, you know, according to Bloomberg, and then about $45 billion estimated in uh, pension overwriting strategies, these short put or short, short call strategies the pensions are doing. So, you know, in, in total, there's about $60 billion of explicit short volatility, which is really, you know, that's big, but that's not that it's not the most concerning aspect. The bigger aspect is this $1.4 trillion in implicit short volatility strategies. So these are replicating the exposures of a portfolio of short options, even though they may not be directly selling derivatives um, or directly selling optionality. So, you know, for example, we have about $600 billion worth of risk parities out there, equity exposure to risk parity. Uh, risk parity is a strategy that's short gamma and short correlations. We have about $400 billion of VAR control funds out there. That's a short gamma strategy, about uh, $250 billion of risk premium strategies. And, and, then, and then there's a, 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 the equity exposure of CTAs. So these are strategies that have elements of a short volatility trade embedded in their equity exposure. And then, you know, at the bottom of this, the bottom of the short volatility trade is the $3.8 trillion worth of share buybacks that have occurred since 2009. One might look at share buybacks, and we can talk about specifics of the, of the buyback phenomenon. You say, wait a minute, that's not a, that is not a financial engineering strategy. That's not, a, that's not a short volatility strategy, but let's think about what share buybacks do. So if you're a corporate CEO, you don't have the ability to generate growth, you can't generate sales, and you want to get your bonus. So if you can't generate earnings, if you can't start, uh, help your top of the line, what you can do is reduce the number of shares, and this will artificially increase the EPS so you can hit your bonus target. Well, you go out and you issue debt, and you buy back your shares. You're leveraging a company up which means that you're exposed to interest rates, you're exposed to market stability, and then you're buying back your shares, resulting in a price-insensitive buyer that is always underneath the market, resulting in this price-insensitive buyer always buying on market dips. So the result of this is that you're artificially reducing realized volatility. If the strategy is always to buy on dips, that is part of the replication strategy of a short variance swap. Literally, it's part of the replication of shorting ball. So when you add all this exposure together, we have this self-reflexive short straddle of financially engineered strategies in the market. And this, this really comes out to about $2 trillion worth of implicit and explicit short volatility strategies. And then you can tack on the share buybacks to some effect that is resulting in this. Leading into 1987, portfolio insurance comprised about 2% of the market, leading into Black Monday. And that was a reflexive strategy. Today, anywhere between 6 to 10% of the market is comprised of these self-reflexive, implicit and explicit shortfall strategies. And this should be concerning. 
there's a lot of people that are very concerned just about the explicit part of this. The people that are essentially profiting from the contango and the VIX term structure by either the XIV ETF or a similar strategy implemented by rolling forward short futures contracts. And a lot of people are very worried about the blow up of that trade. You know, they, I think the, the statistic is if the VIX doubles overnight, that could completely wipe out the XIV ETF, or, or I forget if that's the exact statistic, but something like that. You're saying that really that's the least of our problems. So aside from you know the target manager who's uh, made a bunch of money by by shorting the VIX, what is the full scope of what could go wrong here, and how would it likely go wrong? Would it start with say a, a change where the share buybacks dry up because the interest rates no longer uh, support them, or, or what do you think the catalyst might be, and what could the potential blowback be if this were to start to unwind in the other direction? Sure. There's a lot to talk about on that topic. You know, first of all, on the short VIX trade, I think it's interesting because now it's become very popular to talk about that. I think if you go back and read Artemis's research, dating back as back far as 2014, we, we talked about how it really just a 65% move in, in the VIX could be all that it would take to wipe out those products. We actually presented our numbers years ago on that. Um, I think it's become a very popular thing to talk about today. Um, I think these short vol products, these ETNs, it's it's really funny because you have to be a, you know, Artemis runs a hedge fund, and the regulators are going to require you to, to be a accredited investor and pass all these tests to invest in a hedge fund that trades volatility in a risk-controlled and smart manner, and that's largely going long vol in, a, in a, an intelligent way. Meanwhile, anyone on the street can go out and buy a double-levered VIX ETN or a short-biased VIX ETN. So there's a great irony to this, and I think that these products are a class action lawsuit waiting to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. But are they a systemic risk to the system? Not so much compared to these to the larger short volatility trade. You know, first to, to circle back to the effect of share buybacks. You know, based on our estimates in, in, in the paper, volatility and the alchemy of risk, you know, we've estimated, I think quite conservatively, that th- one-third of the gains, or about 30% of the, of the share price gains since 2009 have come from the f- share buyback phenomenon. And that's, that's pretty amazing, if you think about it. We would already be in an earnings recession if it was not for share buybacks. So, the, the stock market is cannibalizing itself quite literally, and this is having a pronounced effect on lowering vol. Um, I think we've had some of the most mean revertive markets in history. The, the idea that vol is low is not surprising. That's happened before. But one of the things we've been seeing is that every single time volatility jumps, it mean reverts immediately. And that's actually quite unusual because volatility tends to cluster. This has been driven by some of the share buyback effects. So beyond the, the blatant overvaluation uh, of, the, of the market and the fact that price multiples that are not affected by the buyback, that are not – the price-to-earnings ratio is something that people oftentimes put out there and say, oh, the stocks are not that expensive in a price-to-earnings ratio or a P to growth ratio. If you look at a market capitalization to GDP ratio, if you look at a enterprise value to EBITDA ratio, if you look at a price to sales ratio, ratios that are not that are affected by the buyback phenomenon. PE ratios are manipulated by the buyback phenomenon, but the buybacks will will funnel through to something like enterprise value to EBITDA ratio. We are seeing across all these multiples some of the highest overvaluations since 1928, 2007, and the late 90s. So really, the buyback phenomenon leads to a situation of a greater fool where the market keeps going up and up and up, quashing volatility. If we end up seeing a collapse in buybacks, either due to rising interest rates, which make it unprofitable for companies to continue to do this phenomenon, if we see a situation where there is some shock to the system and or credit ratings of companies begin to come into peril as a result of uh, rising interest rates, and they're not willing to continue to issue shares to buy back their debt, the buyback, buyback dynamic may die down. Um, with the tax reform that's happening, it's unlikely to happen this year. To your original question, the original question was, what would lead to this unraveling in a very nasty way? And we can walk through a specific example in 1987 that led into Black Monday, which I think 
could be a template for how this could unravel in a very violent way. But if you have a situation where the market drops 10% in a short period of time, I mean, a short period of time could be anywhere from a day to a week, that blows through some of the shortfall players. Those players will take losses, but they might establish new, the explicit shortfall players may establish new positions into that equity market weakness. But if you have that continue to a 10 to 15% decline in markets, and that is coupled with a volatility rise, and a central bank does not save the day or is unable to save the day, by the time you hit a 10 to 15% decline in markets, then you have the ecosystem of the shortfall players uh, like the risk parity funds, like the VAR control funds, that actually will begin selling their positions in equities based on the gamma effect of, of accumulation of volatility, the first wave of selling might be driven by technical factors. The second wave of selling then is driven by algorithmic framework of these, these larger implicit vol funds selling based on VAR accumulation and correlation breakdowns. That will lead to the explicit short vol players having to cover positions that they established back when the market was down just a little bit you know, on the, the last position. And this can cascade into a very violent cycle. Now, so I want to just take... push back on that for a second there, because it seems to me that in the case of this explicit short vol, if you had a really big move, and you, as you've said earlier in this interview, there have been cases in history where we went to, you know, 60 or 70 on the VIX, that wouldn't just wipe out the XIV, it would put it at a massive negative equity position. So who gets caught holding the bag for that. You can't claw back the investors in the XIV. So does the manager have to pay whatever the uh, the margin call is, so to speak, in order to close that position down? That's what would happen in that scenario. Let's just imagine, and it wouldn't take a VIX moving to 80 overnight. It could be a 65% move in the VIX, which, by the way, occur occurred in February of 2007. This was before the market began selling off in a big way, when the VIX went from about 11 to about 18 you know, imagine a situation where the VIX down at 11 today goes from 11 to 20 overnight. At that point, this results in a, a trigger and most of these shortfall strategies, of course, if you're selling, if you're selling optionality on something like TVIX, one of the double levered products, well, you've got a margin call at that point. And it seems like some of the, it sounds like, and based on what we've looked at, the guys who are, are making $12 million over the past couple of years are, you know, literally selling levered uh, optionality, naked optionality on two times levered products. And of course, if you're doing that, you're going to be in a negative equity position. If you're an investor in something like XIV, then there, there is a trigger clause in that. Those are ETNs. There's a trigger clause in that the issuer can force redeem at an 80% loss. So overnight, someone would have an 80% impairment on all their capital. So in that instance, uh, and depending on the way some of those documents are written, the loss could be a total loss to investors. You know, they, the issuer has this kind of 20% wiggle room to give them room so that they don't take losses. So you know, in this sense, would this be cataclysmic? I, I think it would be terrible. You'd have a lot of small retail investors, maybe some hedge funds that would have complete impairment overnight. I don't think it's a systemic risk. I think the much bigger risk comes when – that shock leads into a, an out-of-control spiral where the implicit shortfall sellers begin to, the guys who are using accumulation of variance to size their equity exposure, then have to deleverage their books in a very fast way. So this is, this is a situation where market drops 12% in two days, which seems like it's crazy, but it's, but it's not at all historically when you look at the range of different possible movements in a crisis. And then as a result of that, we see many of these large implicit shortfall traders who are sizing based on accumulation of all having to deleverage their risk parity books, their VAR control books, their risk premium books. And then that begins to take out margin calls on people who have used the higher vol to establish new short vol positions, and then you're in a, a violent cycle. I think that's a bigger concern to me than just where uh, the short VIX complex is at.
Now, there are a lot of notable bond managers, Bill Gross, Jeff Gundlux, and so forth, who have given one version, and I think Ray Dalio most recently, who have come out and said, okay, hey, the, the gig is up. It looks like the bond market is going to roll over in price, up in yield. Does the increase in uh, cost of borrowing that presumably is going to have a major interruptive effect in share buybacks, is that potentially the catalyst that could start this whole unwind happening? Yeah, mark my word on this. You know, back in the day, everyone sat back and said, oh, the knowledge at the time leading into the last crisis was that the knowledge that was wrong was that all real estate prices nationwide couldn't decline at once. That was, that was the view. That was the view at the time. And then, of course, now we know that it's possible for all of these real estate markets to be correlated with one another and, and to drop. And, that, of course, we know that now. Well, what common knowledge today will be proven wrong in the future? We only need to look in, into the past, actually, empirically, to understand what that is going to be. It's going to be the fact that stocks and bonds are anti-correlated with one another. You know, in my entire life and trading career, and the trading career of almost anyone who is, is managing money today, stocks and bonds have experienced incredible anti-correlation. And, you know, when stocks sell off, central banks ease and, and bonds perform. And risk parity funds have uh, found ways to short that correlation in order to generate excess returns. That's all, that's all a... That's all a risk parity strategy really is, is is a dispersion trading desk coupled with beta exposure to the underlyings. It's not that complex. The excess alpha comes from a short correlation bet. Well, the problem, and that, that, that has been a very good return in an environment where interest rates have dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped. But what's interesting is that if you look at financial history, and I have a graph both in, in the volatility in the allegory of the prisoner's dilemma, which is a paper from 2015. We talk about this at length. Also in the latest paper, uh, Volatility and the Alchemy of Risk, stocks and bonds have actually, if you look at the relationship between stocks and bonds over the past 120 years, they've actually spent more time correlated with one another than they've spent anti-correlated with one another. What's terrifying about this is that the entire modern asset management business is built on a short correlation trade of stocks and bonds. If I go to a financial advisor down the street in Austin, Texas, where my offices are, I say, what should I, where should I put my money in? Stocks and bonds, 60-40 split. And if you go to a risk parity guy, they're going to say, go ahead and put your money in stocks and lever up the bonds. Well, what happens when that trillions of dollars – of financial engineering in this, around this anti-correlation, what happens when that 60-40 stock bond split becomes 100% loser? And you say, wait, that's not going to happen. That's, that's never happened. It absolutely has happened. It absolutely has happened. It happened in the early 1900s. It happened in the late 70s. It's happened. There's numerous times where it's not been a month or two months. It's been three years where stocks and bonds have gone down together. So we are painted in a unique corner right now because can the global financial system handle a scenario where stocks and bonds drop all together at the same time? This is part of the short ball trade because – Implicit in short uh, portfolio short options is a short correlation bet. So there is a massive levered short correlation bet on stability and this relationship that the world is not prepared for. And the thing that I don't understand is why – I mean, granted, caveat here, I run a long volatility fund. In fairness, that long volatility fund is about to close. But we run long vol strategies. But I don't understand why every pension system and institution isn't running into finding ways to get long ball exposure in some capacity. And nowadays, everyone's running away from active management 
They should be running towards tail risk. They should be running towards long volatility strategies. They should be running towards strategies that have shown an ability to uh, have positive correlation and, and do well during periods of market turbulence, like global macro investors, like certain types of CTAs. But instead, everyone's doing the exact opposite. But the question that many of these institutions need to ask themselves is, you know, during the last recession, their bond portfolio did really well. The pension systems up the street, their bond portfolios performed. What would happen if you have a 30% decrease in equities coupled with a 30% decrease in bonds? And there's only one asset class that can perform, any asset class that has long volatility exposure. Now, let me just interject here. If I think about how this could all come unwound, you know, normally if you have a short covering rally in, in anything, in crude oil, in, in copper, when the price goes up, the shorts get squeezed out, they're forced to buy, you've got uncontrolled buying, and it goes up rapidly. What happens when this short vol trade, both the explicit short vol as well as the implicit short vol, when something starts to unwind and all of a sudden these strategies that have been working so well for so long stop working and everybody is bailing out of them all at once? That means everybody's buying vault. Does the act of buying vault create volatility in markets? I would think that suddenly, you know, protection in the form of puts and calls is not available at the same price it was. Does that exacerbate and uh, again reinforce the cycle and create a, you know, a, a crisis situation? Absolutely. Because what we think we know about volatility is all wrong based on based on the very thing you're talking about. If you go to an MBA program or a financial engineering program, they are going to teach you something that is a highly flawed concept. And that's part of modern portfolio theory that conceives volatility as an external measurement of the intrinsic risk of an asset. There's this idea that volatility is a statistic that measures risk. I watch basketball, sort of like, you know, how many shots have you made or how many rebounds have you gotten or how many shots on goal for soccer. Volatility is a statistic measuring a statistic that is external to the game measuring the game. But this isn't true. Modern portfolio theory is wrong because today we have trillions of dollars of strategies where volatility is affecting the outcome and is an input into the strategies. So volatility is not an external statistic measuring the game. Volatility is a player on the field. And modern portfolio theory has it wrong. And we're about to learn what that really means. Now, it feels good when volatility is a player on the field as a result of these strategies allow more leverage into the system when volatility is dropping. So that reinforces lower vol. But anything that can shock volatility higher and cause a forced deleveraging because of the higher vol leading to more higher vol, this produces a self-reflexivity. And we got a taste of that in 1987. Portfolio insurance, which was blamed for the 87 collapse where in one day the market dropped 20%. Portfolio insurance is a short gamma strategy, very similar to risk parity, very similar to bar control funds, has a short gamma component. So, you know, at the time, uh, at the time, portfolio insurance was 2% of the market, of the market capitalization. Today, these self-reflexive strategies comprise potentially upwards of 10% of the market. And I can tell you how we'll get there again. I can't tell you, but I, I, I have a theory of how we can get there again. And I think it's the very thing that central banks are trying to, to cause, which is inflation. And I think something like 87 can happen again based on this. I, maybe I can explain that idea a little bit more. Please do. So in 1987, we're coming in after a long bull market in equities. But inflation was really low. Actually, inflation was lower in January of 1987 than it is today. So the Fed had lowered interest rates in an attempt to get inflation up. And then in a short period of time, we saw inflation jump violently. 
some graphs actually that show this, show the jump in CPI in 1987, a period of really, you know, between January uh, into the summer, uh, inflation jumped almost 300 basis points. And what we saw at that point is that nominal rates jumped even higher. So a period of really five to six months, you have inflation and nominal interest rates shooting up over 300 basis points. Now, the market liked this. This was a bull market. People forget this. From January to August, the equity market in the U.S. exploded, jumping up over 36%. We are in the middle of a bull market. The market's up 36% on the year. And that's when the wheels fell off because it was the very sharp increase in interest rates and the losses in the bond market that began to cause a liquidity squeeze. That liquidity squeeze, it started a fire. And all of a sudden, interbank lending jumped. All of a sudden, credit conditions began to tighten. And this started a fire in equity markets. And equity markets dropped. They dropped about 10%, starting a little over 10% starting between late August and October. And that was the first fire. Now, portfolio insurance, similar to the short fall trade today, is like a barrel of nitroglycerin sitting in the market portfolio. I can be sitting here and have a barrel of nitroglycerin in my office, and it can be incredibly risky. But if nothing sets off that barrel of nitroglycerin, it may just sit there for years. Well, portfolio insurance has these short gamma, short vol characteristics to it, but nothing had triggered it. All of a sudden, you had inflation, jumps in nominal interest rates, leading to liquidity squeeze, and losses on bonds, the Fed was not able to respond because inflation was jumping. So the Fed couldn't come to the rescue. This caused a liquidity squeeze, which started a fire. You had a, about a two-month decrease in equity prices, which then led into the nitroglycerin of portfolio insurance leading to a down 20% day. So the thing that could potentially cause this to unwind may be the thing that they're trying to spur on, which is actually inflation. And that could occur amidst a, a booming market. But if you have a fast increase in interest rates, too fast, right at a point in time where many companies are looking to roll their debt, this could cause a liquidity squeeze that could cause the short vol rate to unwind quite violently. Chris, institutional finance makes such heavy-duty use of over-the-counter derivatives. They've got a lot of big positions on. There's not enough liquidity in the underlying markets to move them quickly, so they deal with their risk by hedging it using OTC derivatives. What happens one day when everybody who's calling up their banker in order to hedge a position is quoted an 80% implied vol on whatever option they need, and they suddenly cannot afford to use all of the instruments that they're used to using in order to manage risk? I mean, it seems like that could be a recipe for a, just a, an overnight disaster. There's so many liquidity imbalances out there. I mean, you have, you have daily liquidity in some of these ETFs on, on underlyings that don't settle daily. So the, the vanishing liquidity phenomenon is, you know, in 1987, people just didn't even pick up the phone. You couldn't reach your broker. Same thing with 2008. So people forget this. Uh, and, and so I think that's, I mean, it's absolutely the point is that during these shocks, you, you can see liquidity vanish. And now in a, in a more algorithmic driven market, the, the, the shocks and the moves can be even quicker than before. We haven't even got started talking about passive investing. Nowadays, everyone, everyone wants to do, all the institutions and the pension systems wants to do, want to do what looks best on a rolling sharp ratio basis. So, you know, on a rolling sharp ratio basis, we've had some of the best performance of index funds in over 200 years. That's another chart that's, you know, in my paper. Um, I, you know, I don't make this stuff up. You just can look at the, look at the data. So, of course, after we've had, you know, a central banking sugar high, which has resulted in, in low vol and high returns, now every institution wants to go fire all their active managers, and they want to go passive. Well, that's great. You know, now 
Bernstein estimates that over 52% of the market will be passive. So now everyone has moved to passive. Well, the problem, if you think about what passive investing does, if every market participant is passive, then each incremental buyer exacerbates right tail vol, and each incremental seller exacerbates left tail vol. That's a mathematical relationship you can model. And it just makes sense. I mean, active investors who buy when stocks get too low and sell when stocks get too high are volatility buffers. They reduce vol. So in a market where everyone moves to passive and they put all the active managers out of business, you have no volatility buffers, and each incremental buyer and seller results in a massive explosion. This is happening right during a period of time where the baby boomers are retiring, and there's going to be forced liquidation of retirement plans. So your next incremental seller is starting now and is amplifying. So it's kind of this perfect storm where you have central banks removing stimulus uh, you have populism rising and anger over central banks. So they're removing stimulus. They're having to normalize interest rates. There's reflationary pressures on the horizon. Corporations over the next, between 2018 and 2020, have to roll $300 billion worth of high-yield debt. A lot of companies have to roll debt coming on up. They're going to be rolling debt into high, higher interest rate environments, right at a point where baby boomers uh, have forced liquidations into, into their retirement plans. Now, that being said, I'm very pessimistic in the long run. But with a tax plan that has just been passed and markets going frothy like this, we could have a, a right tail move before we have a left tail move. Keep in mind that in 1987, the market went up 36% before it ended up dropping 10% or four, about 10 to 14% over the next you know, month and a half, and then drop 20% in a single day. So you had this huge run-up before you had this massive collapse. So, you know, in, in this instance, I think the melt-up possibility is right there, but don't fool yourself into to not seeing what this environment really is. You described the mechanism of injury, if you will, as to how inflation could be the catalyst to start the big unwind. Are there other catalysts that you have your eye on? I mean, certainly geopolitical risk is, is something that people should keep their eye on. You know, it's interesting. You know, I was just in Sweden, spending some time uh, with some people from Norway. And, you know, you don't hear about this stuff, but uh, in Sweden, they just began forced conscription again last year. So first time since the Cold War, and they're spending billions of dollars reinforcing their bunker systems. And Norway has just completed a major, major controversial multi-billion dollar purchase of fighter jets. And Sweden is preparing its citizens for the expectation of potential war with Russia. I mean, this is, you, we don't hear about this in the West. This isn't reported on CNN. So you look at the rising geopolitical tensions, obviously what's happening with North Korea, you know, no one has a crystal ball, but there's a plenty of catalyst out there. And, you know, just the rise of populism in general. I have this firm belief that you cannot destroy risk. There's this view that central banks believe that they can destroy risk by setting, setting the price of risk low, but you don't destroy risk, you only transmute it. So you can take returns from the future, you can bring them to the present. You can take uh, tail risk from the present and you can transmute it and push it into the future. But volatility cannot be destroyed, it can only be transmuted. So if they refuse to allow volatility to transmute through the price mechanism, it will transmute through the social mechanism of populism. This is a very big risk. So I, I, can't, I can't foreshadow all the, all the outcomes of what might be a catalyst. But you know, if you just look across history, we, we've gone the longest ever without a 5% decline in markets. It's the longest bull market in history. Volatility is at multi-generational lows across asset classes. You know, one has to just look at this and say, this is the, what we've normalized to is not is not a reality that reflects what, what markets have normalized and leveraged themselves into uh, 10 trillion in negative rates. I can go on and on and on. This is not a, this is not a reality that has reflected the data we've seen in 100, 200 years of financial history. 
and that we've applied more and more leverage to the assumption of a reality that is unusually stable. And we've become more and more anti-fragile doing it. Chris, we only have a few minutes left. Unfortunately, we couldn't get to every single slide in the excellent deck that you sent us. I'm sure our listeners will enjoy going over those. But as we have two or three minutes remaining here, please give us any closing thoughts that you may have that are germane to this conversation. I think this concept at the end of the day of... It's one of the things I respect more managing money as an adult than I did when I was just trading for fun as a kid. But there is a real business risk that people have in this industry, and it's one of the reasons why there's opportunity. If you're someone in a pension system or if you're a manager and you, you're you're not fired for doing what worked the last three years. And you are fired for underperforming in bull markets just a little bit. So the person who wins, it's the tortoise and hare problem. The person who wins in the short term is the one who loses in the long term. But the problem is that, that like the tortoise and hare, you know, the tortoise wins the race. But in our industry, the tortoise gets fired midway through the race because he's underperforming the hare. And institutions will jump into all of these products that worked yesterday rather than the ones that are likely to work tomorrow. And that is, you know, it's, in 2012, I uh, came out and said uh, everyone wanted to get into tail risk. And I wrote a paper saying that tail risk was incredibly overvalued and overpriced, that the left tail was, was the wrong tail to focus on, that people should focus on the right tail. And I said that in 2012, that the left tail events were priced in. Now, obviously, the reason why left tail risk was so expensive is because people were suffering from post-traumatic deflation disorder, and strategies that were long vol had a positive return um, or positive sharp ratio. Now, fast forward to today, nobody wants to hedge anything. No one wants to think about the next 10 years. Everyone wants to short volatility. Everyone's focused on index funds. Everyone's focused on the things that have a three times sharp ratio over the last two to three years. And... As a result, and anyone who does something otherwise faces real business risk. So the business risk is the thing that drives these large institutions to make the exact wrong moves and not be forward thinking. And I think that's something that's, I think there's just a fundamental flaw in the way that, in the way that the world is aligned, that that, that capitalism is aligned in the short termism. The thing that drives corporations to be, you know, issuing share buybacks when um, their shares are at historic high valuations. Uh, so, you know, you know, with that in mind, I think this presents an opportunity for investors who are nimble and smart and are forward-thinking. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, it it really hurts the common guy on the street. And uh, I, and I. And I think the real risk we face right now is, you know, it's the real risk at the end of the day is not the market dropping 50%. It's really rising populism, rising income disparity, resulting in a threat to the, to the very fabric of democracy and the framework. Um, and I think the next failure of our systems, we are going to face that tail risk if we're not careful. And I think the, I think the central bankers in power are, are quite numb or ignorant to this. Extremely well said, and unfortunately, I couldn't agree with you more. Chris, I want to thank you for a really fantastic interview. Before we go, I want to direct our listeners to the Research Roundup email. If you're not a registered user yet, just go to macrovoices.com. You can register and get the download information from the website next to Chris's picture. In addition to your most recent article, Volatility and the Alchemy of Risk, we have your slide deck. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the slides today, as well as several other articles that are linked there. Now, I know that because you run a hedge fund, you're not at liberty to talk publicly about the fund and what it invests in. But we do have a large uh, number of accredited investors in our audience. For those accredited investors who'd like to contact you to find out more about your fund offerings, how can they do so? 
Sure. We have a website um, that's uh, www.artemiscm.com, or, uh, or one could just simply uh, email info at artmiscm.com uh, as well for credit investors that might have interest in what we're doing. And, of course, I think all of our folks know the game, but you have to identify yourself as an accredited investor and request information from the fund. They can't offer it to you until you ask. Chris, thank you again for a fantastic interview. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. Macro Voices is a listener-driven program. Please email requests for specific future interview guests to requests at macrovoices.com. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com, and we'll answer them on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. We also welcome your suggestions for how we can improve the program. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Now, Eric, what a great interview with Chris. Now, I've been looking for a while for a guest with a kind of quant-focused show, and Chris didn't disappoint. You know, I love a lot of quant analysts out there. You know, I'm a huge fan of guys like Marco Kolonovic, J.P. Morgan, or uh, Charlie McElligott or RBC, or uh, Michael Hartnett at uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. These analysts, uh, when they look at things from this quant perspective, they kind of show all of these different risks in the underlying. I love the idea of understanding how imbalanced the risk parity funds and all these other elements are and how much low vol risk there really exists out there. But, you know, I thought that was what I wanted to start talking about. But then it really resonated with me when Chris, at the end, you asked him, you know, if he had anything else to kind of add or, or mention. And then he, he brought up the topic of business risk in managing money. And, and that triggered something for me, like that comparison of the tortoise and the hare. And it's, it's the idea that you haven't been fired for doing what's been working for the last three years, but you were fired for underperforming the bull market. In the late stages, what happens is all the assets under management, AUMs, move from all of the people that were too conservative and too careful to all the people that are long, high beta, high leverage, have been making all these returns, you know, sharp ratios through the roof and making all this money. And it resonated with me because he said the idea that, look, you know, the tortoise wins wins the race over the long term, but sometimes the tortoise gets fired midway through the race. And, you know, I kind of look at it because I, it, it triggers me because I, I've always been an incredibly conservative guy. Anyone that has followed me for the last couple of years knows that I've always been, you got to be cautious. You got to spend some money on the hedges. You know, this, uh, this is going to have an ugly end at some point on the other side. And it kind of resonated with me because, you know, I've got, had the opportunity in the last 20 years to have witnessed two of the biggest bear markets, the 2000-2003 plunge and the 2007-2008 market drop. And during that time, the amount of people that I have seen that have lost their life savings, just been destroyed by this, uh, the, it's, you know, there's a story, uh, this one guy that called me half an hour before Nortel's earnings back in 99, 2000, I can't remember a specific date. Uh, he called me and put his entire life sa- savings into Nortel stock margined. And that day, Nortel dropped from $90 after the uh, closing bell when they announced down to $60. And I had to call him the next day to tell him that he not only lost all of his life savings, but he owed us money and he took out a line of credit to meet the margin call and lost that too. You know, and then I remember back in uh, 2000, uh, sorry, 2007, 2008, where grown men come see me in my office uh, asking if I could fix what their problems were, where they literally were down 80% on their investment portfolios and they're almost crying because they don't know how they're going to explain it to their spouse. And I always remember that and I was like, I need to make sure that my members that I that we are prepared that, that, that this does not happen to them again and yet though when the more ca- cautious you are the more you play that tortoise game everyone's but you look at all this money that you missed by not being in but you know it all comes to roost uh, in the end what did you take away from that interview well patrick so many smart people have said and i certainly agree 
we're not going to avoid having another financial crisis. Janet Yellen was wrong to say that we won't have one in our lifetime. In fact, we're getting pretty darn close to do for one. And of course, you never know exactly what the cause of the next crisis is going to be. It's usually a safe bet that it won't be the same thing as what caused the last crisis. And you know, I don't know what's going to cause the next crisis. But boy, if you wanted to pick a, a really top contender, it is this short vol situation which I don't think I fully understood until really getting into this interview with Chris, that pyramid slide that just shows that, you know, what uh, Jesse Felder and a lot of other people are all excited about with this short VIX trade is like a tiny piece of the overall short uh, volatility picture. And, you know, the thing, if, if you really want to know what I related to the most in the interview, it was right at the very end when he said, and, you know, we, we look at the potential of really serious social consequence. Face it, Patrick, the last crisis was a really big deal in 2008, 2009, caused a lot of human hardship. But frankly, governments were in a very good position to respond to it and to help people. And, you know, they bailed the banks out, unfortunately, rather than... Uh, the people that needed it the most. We're not in that situation anymore. The Fed has backed itself into a corner where it doesn't really have much room to accommodate. Well, the government in general is nowhere close to as well financed as it was then. We are potentially looking at whatever the next crisis is leading to massive human hardship. And I think that, you know, I think at one point he said something like people at some point just throw up their hands and tear the system down because they're so frustrated. And I think uh, it's true. There is a lot of corruption you know, the, the bailouts of Wall Street in 2007, 8, 9 uh, it helped Wall Street. They didn't really help the average human being. And I don't think they're going to get away with that the next time around. So systemic risk that comes in the form of the people just being fed up with everything and insisting on tearing the system down and rebuilding it from scratch, I think is a very realistic risk if the next uh, crisis is dramatically worse than the last one. That sort of, I guess, uh, plays into the whole fourth turning thing that uh, you uh, uh, bring up show after show. And it really is going to be interesting to play out. But, it, you know, it's amazing, though, is that this is not just our lone voice that is touting this. You know, what's amazing is out in Davos, you have all of the gathering of the, uh, the elites of the world. And Bloomberg just put out a piece basically saying that bank CEOs are worried markets are complacent like they were in 2006. And I just thought it was really interesting to share that Bloomberg article, some of the uh, excerpts to kind of that some of the big CEOs, like for instance, Citigroup's chief executive officer there, Michael uh, Corbat, basically uh, said, there is a numbness out there. There is an ambivalence out there that is concerning. When the next turn comes, and it will come, it's likely to be more violent than it would otherwise be if we let some of the pressure off along the way. So look, look, we have their CEOs of the actual major banks already talking about how, how the conditions are already setting up that way. How about Jess Stanley, the CEO of Barclays, who basically said, I do feel like it's a little bit like 2006. We're all talking whether we've solved the riddle of the economic crisis. And goes on to say, we've got a monetary policy that's still uh, in the remnants of the depression era. We've got very little capacity in in the capital markets to deal with the real moves in interest rates. And to top it all off, you had Carlisle's David Rubenstein basically come out and said, the biggest concern I have is that most people think there's no problem of a likely recession this year or next year. Generally, when people are happy and confident, something wrong happens. And so here we have some of the smartest guys out in Davos uh, already t uh, saying that there's all these the writing on the wall and the concerns, but it seems like the market is like, no, nah, it's bullish. Everything's good. You have gotta stay long. You know, the, the hair is winning the race. You gotta just keep going along with this and keep making money. But there are these risks developing in the markets. That certainly is true. And I guess on that upbeat note, Patrick, we should probably move on to some strategies in terms terms of how to deal with this situation. I'll tell you, listening to Chris today, it just made me think, boy, you know, I want so badly to be long vol, but I sure don't want to buy the VIX and pay the negative K 
carry on that trade and just wait to be proven right someday and, and, and you know, lose a fortune to uh, subsidize the target manager's retirement uh, on, until I'm right. So it seems like you've got to have a fairly complex strategy where you somehow can cover that carry cost, have tail risk exposure to volatility, but find a way not to be paying the, the full carry on doing that. And of course, the ratio call spread webinar that you just did last weekend, which people can listen to at bigpicturetrading.com, you know, that's one way to contain this. Are there any other strategies that you want to talk about in terms of options? Because I, I think just, you know, buying straddles and, and being exposed to volatility without having some way of recapturing that carry cost until something breaks. It seems like a losing proposition. What do you think? Well, you know what? I'll tell you, it is a really interesting market today. You know, I'm not the first option strategist out there uh, to say it, but this is arguably one of the biggest option mispricings I've ever seen in my career. And, you know, at this stage, we have a market that while we don't have huge up-down volatility, it is pretty consistently melting upwards. And there is upside volatility in this marketplace, but yet you can tell just by the broader market's volatility that it's very low, very cheap to express trade with options. And this is not a common occurrence. Often, if you, let's say, for instance, a company that's about to become incredibly volatile into a news event, spreads widen, vol premiums come in on the options, the options become more expensive, discounting that in. And normally, the idea that you can have really cheap options to be able to express these trades is not a common thing. This is why normally I n don't trade things like straddles or uh, I, right now I'm calendaring straddles or, or doing these kind of ratio spreads spreads, whether calls or puts. These are strategies that normally are not uh, strategies that work very well. But in this very low vol period, they're all really interesting ways to express your views of higher or lower markets. And, you know, the, obviously we've had a, a pretty good spike in volatility just in the last week. And particularly what's interesting about it is the fact that the vol has been spiking into a rising market, which is something a number of people have also pointed out. Normally you'll see that spike when markets are dropping, but some of that vol premiums coming in, but even just a week ago, it was so cheap to to express all sorts of neat ideas in the marketplace, you know, but as far as I'm concerned right now, you, you got to remove tail risk on the downside. It, like, like Chris was saying, it's about right now before it was the right wing tail risk. Now it's the left wing tail risk. Uh, we've now reached an extreme point where you want to really find tr strategies where you can be in the markets, but you can't get killed if, if uh, one of those events occurs on the far end, whether it's as simple as buying a protective pull but whether it's expressing the upside with uh, high delta in the money calls, there's all sorts of strategies that you can do, keeping it simple or making it advanced. To, but you definitely want to take advantage of these conditions. Absolutely. And I think, you know, something we can't stress strongly enough is it's just crazy that in this environment where there is so much risk, so much tail risk, the fact that options are just cheap, record, record cheap on a historical basis is amazing. And so taking advantage of those strategies where they're available and using that cheap volatility to your advantage is certainly something that investors should consider in their strategies. Now, Eric, I just wanted to touch on one last thing before we wrap things up. There was a, also a coming out of Davos, some really interesting comments from uh, Kenneth Rogoff, which is that Harvard University professor that was speaking out there. And not only did he have an interesting comment about the stock market, but he also had an interesting comment on cryptocurrencies. I thought we'd share it and kind of uh, discuss it a little bit. But Rogoff basically said, in quote, says, if interest rates go up even modestly halfway to their normal level, you will see a collapse in the stock market. And he goes on, I do not know how everything from art and Bitcoin to uh, stock prices will react as interest rates go up. And I thought, first of all, that was really interesting because here we have, uh, you said it earlier, Gunlack, Gross, and, and now um, Ray Dalio uh, come out and they're all the bond uh, bull markets over. We're now entering the bond bear market, right? That's higher interest rates. And here we have uh, Rogoff basically saying, well, uh, 
good luck for the stock market if if that actually is the case. Uh, and so I thought that was really interesting. But also what was really interesting is he commented on cryptocurrencies. And, you know, coming from Davos, I think this is a message for all of our listeners because we've taken a, um, we have two types of listeners, uh, macro voices, you know, the ones that are skeptical of, uh, of cryptocurrencies. And of course, then there's the ones that are uh, firm believers of its future. And we've uh, had many episodes where we've discussed everything from blockchain and, and how the whole thing plays out. I mean, you've been outspoken about your views on, on this uh, for years, but it's the fact that he said it was really interesting to me. He said, but we interpret cryptocurrencies to be anonymous or nearly anonymous currencies. Governments can't allow that on a large scale. So he turns around and says, it's okay if they exist in, when small, but once it gets big enough, it's a problem. He goes, but as cryptocurrencies make it easier for tax evasion, crime and corruption to take place around the world, anti-money laundering laws are going to have to step in and shut them down. He goes, that's coming. There's no doubt about it. And I thought that was really important because everyone keeps thinking that, that you know, that this is going to be uh, the new era, new time, but it's only a matter of time before the government's clamp in. And here you've got right out of Davos from the elite telling you exactly how this plays out. You know, and he, he made that final comment. He says, even in the best case scenario, Bitcoin will probably be like MySpace. Remember that before Facebook? You know, and uh, I just thought it was really interesting. What's your take on that? Well, Patrick, I guess Professor Rogoff must be listening to macro voices because he's using all of my old lines. I, I've said it would be outlawed uh, by governments, and I didn't use MySpace. I think I said that Bitcoin is the uh, palm pilot of cryptocurrencies, and that as soon as there's a better technology that doesn't rely on this proof-of-work algorithm that is a, a huge shortcoming of blockchain, that uh, there will be something better. But I, I would say, just to kind of put another side to that argument, Ken Rogoff has been very outspoken on subjects like banning cash, which he's advocated in order to enable deeply negative interest rates as a monetary policy tool. He said that we should ban cash in order to combat terrorism and you know tax evasion and so forth. So he's kind of a, an outspoken guy. I think he has a political view on this, and although he's very much one of the elite voices at Davos, uh, you know, in the past, just because he'd said it, they didn't outlaw cash just because he thought they should. So I don't know that, that anything is imminent just because he said it, but he's certainly echoing the, the same things that I've said many times over, which is very likely uh, digital currency will be a huge part of the future. There's no reason to think that this early prototype, this Edsel or MySpace or Palm Pilot of cryptocurrencies called Bitcoin is still going to be around several years from now. It doesn't mean that the digital currency won't be around, but there's no reason to think that just because you've been holding Bitcoin and spelling it wrong, because that's the cool thing to do in Bitcoin circles, that you know, you're going to be a billionaire and because you got in on the ground floor. It's not going to go down that way. But uh, I, I don't think because Ken Rogoff said it that that means it's going to happen tomorrow either. You know, Eric, you're absolutely right. You know, he's he's uh, certainly had his pieces about outlawing cash and other things, and, and it doesn't always play out that way. But it is interesting. We, we said it so many times on this show. It's just th there's no way that the governments are going to sit back and let this all play out over a long enough time frame. It's just a matter of time. But how it plays out is something that I guess all of us don't really know. It's, uh, it's going to be a very interesting times over the next couple of years for sure. Well, speaking of a matter of time, it's time to wrap the show. So, folks, we need your help. Please help us promote Macro Voices. Tell your friends and colleagues about it. Forward your research roundup emails. And most importantly, go to macrovoices.com if you haven't already. Register your free account. It's free. It only takes a few minutes to register. We're not going to spam you or try to sell you anything. The benefit to you is that you'll receive our free research roundup email every week, which contains download links for content from our featured guests as well as all the best free content we could find on the internet each week. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's Research Roundup. 
All right, and this week you're going to find the transcript for this uh, week's interview with Chris. You'll also find the link to the chart book to accompany the interview that we just had. There's also a great article from Jesse Felder titled, According to These Three Measures, the Stock Market is Literally Off the Charts. And there, uh, an additional link in there as well from that Bloomberg article that we just referenced from the bank CEOs worried about the market uh, com uh, complacency. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better now for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners email us at research roundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the mvrr hashtag on twitter and we'll include it in our weekly distributions if you have not already follow our main twitter account at macro voices for all the most recent updates and releases you can also follow eric on twitter at Eric S. Townsend, and myself, at Patrick Ceresna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly Research Roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at MacroVoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. Slide 5 here in your presentation about what you're calling the explicit short vol trade, the shorting of the VIX and so forth. You're describing that that's really only a small piece of a much larger trade or a much larger trend that involves short volatility. So give us the picture of what is the overall extent of this short vol trade and what does this pyramid show us on page 5? Yeah, the short vol trade, if you look at short volatility and you think about what, what volatility really is, it's the bet on stability. It's a bet on stability. And when you're betting on stability, that's a myriad of different bets. Part of that is the expectation that markets remain low volatility or low realized volatility. Part of that is a short gamma bet. So there's this implicit short gamma exposure. There's part of that is a bet against uh, that correlations remain stable or that different market relationships from, remain anti-correlated with one another and that or implied correlations are dropping or in realized correlations are dropping. And the other aspect of the short volatility bet is that interest rates remain low or go lower. So if we look at each of these different factors, 
these are the risk exposures that you will have when you own a portfolio of short options. If you own a portfolio of short options, you're short vega, you're short gamma, you're short correlation, you're short interest rates. Well, what we've seen now with the short vol trade, both explicitly and implicitly, is that various financial engineering strategies out there that have become dominant in the marketplace. I mean, we're talking about the largest hedge funds in the world employ these strategies that are just replicating the exposures of a short option portfolio. And of course, you know, the VIX, the VIX trade gets a lot of attention, but it's the smallest portion of the short vol trade. And this is what we call explicitly shorting volatility. This is where you're literally going out and you're shorting an option or you're shorting a volatility future. But, you know, in the VIX space, you know, that's only about $5 billion worth of short exposure. Um, you have about $8 billion in vol selling funds, you know, according to Bloomberg, and then about $45 billion estimated in uh, pension overriding strategies, these short put or short, short call strategies the pensions are doing. So, you know, in, in total, there's about $60 billion of explicit short volatility, which is really, you know, that's big, but that's not that it's not the most concerning aspect. The bigger aspect is this $1.4 trillion in implicit short volatility strategies. So these are replicating the exposures of a portfolio of short options, even though they may not be directly selling derivatives um, or directly selling optionality. So, you know, for example, we have about $600 billion worth of risk parities out there, equity exposure to risk parity. Uh, risk parity is a strategy that's short gamma and short correlations. We have about $400 billion of VAR control funds out there. That's a short gamma strategy, about $250 billion of risk premium strategies. And, and, then, and then there's a, 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 the equity exposure of CTAs. So these are strategies that have elements of a short volatility trade embedded in their equity exposure. And then, you know, at the bottom of this, the bottom of the short volatility trade is the $3.8 trillion worth of share buybacks that have occurred since 2009. One might look at share buybacks, and we can talk about specifics of the, of the buyback phenomenon. You say, wait a minute, that's not a, that is not a financial engineering strategy. That's not, a, that's not a short volatility strategy, but let's think about what share buybacks do. So if you're a corporate CEO, you don't have the ability to generate growth, you can't generate sales, and you want to get your bonus. So if you can't generate earnings, if you can't start, uh, help your top of the line, what you can do is reduce the number of shares, and this will artificially increase the EPS, so you can hit your bonus target. Well, you go out and you issue debt, and you buy back your shares. You're leveraging a company up, which means that you're exposed to interest rates, you're exposed to market stability, and then you're buying back your shares, resulting in a price-insensitive buyer that is always underneath the market, resulting in this price-insensitive buyer always buying on market dips. So the result of this is that you're artificially reducing realized volatility. If the strategy is always to buy on dips, that is part of the replication strategy of a short variant swap. Literally, it's part of the replication of shorting ball. So when you add all this exposure together, we have this self-reflexive short straddle of financially engineered strategies in the market. And this, this really comes out to about $2 trillion worth of implicit and explicit short volatility strategies. And then you can tack on the share buybacks to some effect that is resulting in this. Leading into 1987, portfolio insurance comprised about 2% of the market, leading into Black Monday. And that was a reflexive strategy. Today, anywhere between 6 to 10% of the market is comprised of these self-reflexive, implicit and explicit short fall strategies. And this should be concerning. There's a lot of people that are very concerned just about the explicit part of this. The people that are essentially profiting from the contango and the VIX term structure by either the XIV ETF or a similar strategy implemented by rolling forward short futures contracts. And a lot of people are very worried about the blow up. Something's got to bounce back and I'm not sure what. 
Is this a false head fake in the dollar and the dollar is going to fake everybody out with one last bottom and then go rocketing to the upside? Is gold just slow to react? Is this a head fake on higher treasury yields and we're actually going to move to lower treasury yields and gold is going to move up? Uh, I don't know, but these three things don't add up in the motions that we've seen this week. And I'm waiting for uh, something to give to indicate what's going on. All right. Well, let's move on to crude oil. Crude oil just broke out at once again to a fresh new high, giving a little bit of a back right now as we go into uh, today's close. But what's your thinking here on crude? Well, I said last week that we were on the cusp of a reversal to the downside, and we were. We got a reversal to the downside for all of two bucks down to the 13-day moving average, touched it exactly, and reversed higher. And the 13-day is not at all a a, a big correction. That's one of the very short-dated moving averages. That's about as small as a correction can get and still be called a correction, and then moved higher. Inventory this week, crude oil drawing down one. 1.1 1.1 million barrels. Remember, though, we're seasonally at the time of year when we should be seeing builds on inventory. So even though 1.1 million barrels is not a huge drawdown, any drawdown this time of year is a pretty big deal. Cushing, Oklahoma, drawing down 3.2 million barrels. That's a huge drawdown for Cushing, Oklahoma, and it's I don't know how many in a row we've had now. Keystone Pipeline spill is over. That's not affecting things, and we've had week after week after week of really big Cushing drawdown. These are all very bullish factors. Now, gasoline built 3.1 million barrels. Distillates building 639,000 barrels. Uh, It was a roller coaster on inventory. First it was up, then it was down, then it was back up again. Production up 128,000 barrels per day. Now, that's a big deal. That's a big number, and it's real this week. We had a bigger up number last week, but the number up last week was really just compensating out the fact we'd had a big drop the week before. This is uh, actually a significant new increase to a, a new high. So, you know, one week doesn't make a trend, but it looks like production's picking up. Certainly, the inventory draw, which is bullish, won out over the bearish increase in production because we saw a really big move all the way up to 66.67, right around Thursday morning's open on the New York cash session at 9 a.m. And it's been down all day. And it was really interesting, Patrick, because the resistance, the key resistance level until yesterday was 65 spot 11. Now that's the 200 month moving average. That's a, a pretty big line in the sand. Broke through it very decisively on Wednesday to the upside, moved you know more than a dollar uh, above it. And then as we got into this afternoon's close, we closed the pit session at 2.30 p.m. at 65 spot 51. That's 40 cents above that key level. But just minutes after the pit close, the market pushed all the way down, and sure enough, we tested just below 65 spot 11, which is the key number. I think the low print was 65.08. Bounced off of it up to about 65 spot 37. Then as we came into the 4 p.m. close of the uh, cash session where the ETFs are affecting the price of oil. We got another test, not quite down to 65.11. I think on that test, this low print was around 65.14, 65.15. And as we're speaking now, we're back up to 65 spot 25, just a few minutes after 4 p.m. I could easily see fireworks in either direction in the overnight session tonight, Patrick. The people who were trying to sell it below that key level and didn't get it there during the cash session may try to jerk the market lower in order to perpetrate a a stop run this evening. Or, you know, maybe Asia wakes up and says, hey, that 65.11 was key resistance yesterday. It held as support today. Time to buy like crazy, and maybe we'll wake up and see 67 tomorrow. Uh, I could see 63 or 67 tomorrow morning, and I wouldn't be surprised either way. The trend so far, if 65 spot 11 holds, has been strong and positive. And it may continue. You know, you could easily make an argument for 69 or $70 WTI here just based on the tape action that we've seen. 
On the other hand, though, you know, at some point, we've got this massive, massive imbalance of speculative long interest, 11 to 1 ratio of speculative longs to shorts, all-time record of cumulative longs in energy products across the board between WTI and gasoline and and, uh, the various other products, heating oil and so forth. At some point, even OPEC is going to object to higher prices because they don't want to restart the U.S. shale revolution. I don't know what that number is, but I think we're getting close. So right now, if I look at this, if 65 spot 11 holds and we don't take it out to the downside, uh, I think that uh, $70 WTI may be in the cards. We've already seen $70 Brent. $70 WTI may be coming. On the other hand, when this does unwind, and I'm not sure when it's going to happen, it could get ugly pretty fast because of that massive speculative long interest that could start selling all at once. Everybody is on one side of the boat here. And it doesn't mean they all have to jump ship. Right now, the trend is still up and it's strong. But when it does reverse, if everybody starts jumping ship at the same time, it could get ugly and it could get ugly pretty fast. All right. Well, thanks for the summary, Eric. Now, this week's featured interview guest is Chris Cole, founder of Artemis Capital. Eric's interview with Chris is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at macrovoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me next on the program is Artemis Capital founder, Chris Cole. Chris is an expert on volatility in equity markets, and we're going to focus the interview primarily on that subject. Chris has written an excellent article called Volatility and the Alchemy of Risk, which is available in the public domain, but for your convenience, we've also linked it in your research roundup email. Also linked in your research roundup email is a slide presentation, which is not public domain, and Artemis has asked us to remind you to please observe the request on the first page that this is intended only for Macro Voices listeners. Please don't post it on the internet, forward it, or otherwise redistribute it. Chris, in the beginning of the presentation, you start with this Ouroboros, I believe it's called, which is the symbol of the snake eating itself. Tell us why you start the presentation with that particular graphic and how it relates to the market. Sure. Uh, The Ouroboros is a Greek word meaning tail devourer. And this is one of the oldest symbols in human civilization, which essentially shows a snake consuming its own body in perfect symmetry. This is actually based on a real phenomenon. In nature, when a snake becomes overheated and is unable to regulate its body temperature, it will have a spike in metabolism leading to a state of mania. And in this state of mania, the snake will look at its own tail and see it as prey. And the snake will begin to self-cannibalize itself until really it dies. To me, the Ouroboros as a symbol is a metaphor for the financial alchemy driving this modern bull market. Volatility across asset classes is really at multi-generational lows. But there's now a dangerous feedback loop that exists between ultra-low interest rates, debt expansion, central bank stimulus, and asset volatility, and then financial engineering that's allocating risk based on that volatility. And this is leading into a self-reflexive loop where lower volatility feeds into lower vol, but in the event that we have the wrong type of shock to the system, I believe this can reverse violently where higher volatility then reinforces higher vol. And this this is a, a much bigger risk in today's market environment. It's one that's not being correctly discounted. On page three, it looks like you're essentially using the snake to describe a vicious cycle of factors that feed one another. Give us the quick run through of what that cycle is and how it works before we move on to some of your more specific slides. Sure. I think we look at the global short volatility trade, and I take a very, very wide description of what I call short vol. But this now represents an estimated $2 trillion in financial engineering strategies that are exerting influence and are simultaneously influenced by stock market volatility. And this is just an equity vol. Actually, this phenomena exists in other forms of volatility. I focus on equity volatility. But it really begins with central bank stimulus. You have central banks that have created this preemptive strike on risk. There's this view that they will always be there to support markets. Uh, They've lowered interest rates to the lowest levels in the history of human civilization with data going back to the, the 1200s. 
in some cases even negative rates. There's almost $10 trillion worth of negative rates out there. This has led to a dynamic where there's a glut of savings. It's very difficult to get value. And corporations are finding that it's not very efficient to reinvest uh, in human capital or in CapEx. So instead of doing that, they are literally eating themselves. They are buying back their shares, leveraging, using debt to leverage, and then using that, that cash to buy back their shares. This has resulted in a price insensitive buyer that's always there to buy back the market, which has destroyed realized volatility. This has led to the outperformance of short volatility trades. It's led to the outperformance of passive funds and indexation. And it's led to the outperformance of various strategies that bet, that use financial engineering in some way to bet on market stability, introducing kind of a short gamma effect into the market. These could be strategies ranging from everything from risk parity to VAR rebalancing funds. So this is all great as long as volatility is low or dropping, as long as markets are stable. But in the event that we have a reversal in this, this $2 trillion of equity exposure, that self-reflexive driving lower vol can reverse in in a quite violent way. And I think this graphic we worked on the concept and the execution was done by Brendan Wyeth, but uh, the concept that, came, that I came up with here, I think shows this in, a, in a, a visual way. Now, corporate buybacks particularly interested me when I read your paper because I'm very familiar with the idea that corporate buybacks are fueling this stock market rally. But there was a couple of points that you made there that I thought were very interesting. One is that you know, equity investors just have it programmed into their minds that if you've got a trend of improving earnings per share, if EPS is in a growth trend, that can only mean that the company is making money and, in fact, its profits are improving over time. And you point out that's not really true because when companies are buying back their own shares, it effectively has this this artificial effect of increasing earnings per share because the denominator is being reduced. There's not as many shares. But that really, I think, most people don't register that. They don't realize that when earnings per share is growing, that it really doesn't necessarily mean that the company is profitable. In addition, though, you're describing that as a type of short vol trade. So how should we be thinking about short vol? Because we've done a lot of interviews in this program about the short vol trade. But frankly, we're only talking, if I move on to that trade, you know, I think the, the statistic is if the VIX doubles overnight, that could completely wipe out the XIV ETF, or or I forget if that's the exact statistic, but something like that. You're saying that really that's the least of our problems. So aside from, you know, the target manager who's uh, made a bunch of money by, by shorting the VIX, what is the full scope of what could go wrong here and how would it likely go wrong? Would it start with, say, a change where the share buybacks dry up because the interest rates no longer uh, support them? Or, or what do you think the catalyst might be and what could the potential blowback be if this were to start to unwind in the other direction? Sure. There's a lot to talk about on that topic. You know, first of all, on the short VIX trade, I think it's interesting because now it's become very popular to talk about that. I think if you go back and read Artemis's research, dating back as back far as 2014, we, we talked about how it really just a 65% move in, in the VIX could be all that it would take to wipe out those products. We actually presented our numbers years ago on that. Um, I think it's become a very popular thing to talk about today. Um, I think these short vol products, these ETNs, it's, it's really funny because you have to be a, you know, Artemis runs a hedge fund and the regulators are going to require you to, to be a accredited investor and pass all these tests to invest in a hedge fund that trades volatility in a risk controlled and smart manner and that's largely going long vol in, a, in an intelligent way. Meanwhile, anyone on the street can go out and buy a double levered VIX ETN or a short biased VIX ETN. So there's a great irony to this. And I think that these products are a class action lawsuit waiting to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. But are they a systemic risk to the system? Not so much compared to, these, to the larger short volatility trade. You know, first, to, to circle back to the effect of share buybacks, you know, based on our estimates in, in, in the paper, volatility and the alchemy of risk, you know, we've estimated, I think quite conservatively, that one-third of the gains, or about 30% of the, of the share price gains, 
since 2009 have come from the share buyback phenomenon. And that's, that's pretty amazing. If you think about it, we would already be in an earnings recession if it was not for share buybacks. So the, the stock market is cannibalizing itself quite literally, and this is having a pronounced effect on lowering vol. Um, I think we've had some of the most mean revertive markets in history. The, the idea that vol is low is not surprising. That's happened before. But one of the things we've been seeing is that every single time volatility jumps, it mean reverts immediately. And that's actually quite unusual because volatility tends to cluster. This has been driven by some of the share buyback effects. So beyond the, the blatant overvaluation uh, of, the, of the market and the fact that price multiples that are not affected by the buyback, that are not, the price to earnings ratio is something that people oftentimes put out there and say, oh, the stocks are not that expensive in a price to earnings ratio or a PE to growth ratio. If you look at a market capitalization to GDP ratio, if you look at a enterprise value to EBITDA ratio, if you look at a price to sales ratio, ratios that are not, that are affected by the buyback phenomenon. PE ratios are manipulated by the buyback phenomenon, but the buybacks will, will funnel through to something like enterprise value to EBITDA ratio. We are seeing across all these multiples some of the highest overvaluations since 1928, 2007, and the late 90s. So really, the buyback phenomenon leads to a situation of a greater fool where the market keeps going up and up and up, quashing volatility. If we end up seeing a collapse in buybacks, either due to rising interest rates, which make it unprofitable for companies to continue to do this phenomenon, if we see a situation where there is some shock to the system and or credit ratings of companies begin to come into peril as a result of uh, rising interest rates and they're not willing to continue to issue shares to buy back their debt, the buyback, buyback dynamic may die down. Um, with the tax reform that's happening, it's unlikely to happen this year. To your original question, the original question was, what would lead to this unraveling in a very nasty way? And we can walk through a specific example in 1987 that led into Black Monday, which I think could be a template for how this could unravel in a very violent way. But if you have a situation where the market drops 10% in a short period of time, I mean, a short period of time could be anywhere from a day to a week, that blows through some of the shortfall players. Those players will take losses, but they might establish new, the explicit shortfall players may establish new positions into that equity market weakness. But if you have that continue to a 10 to 15% decline in markets, and that is coupled with a volatility rise, and a central bank does not save the day or is unable to save the day, by the time you hit a 10 to 15% decline in markets, then you have the ecosystem of the shortfall players uh, like the risk parity funds, like the VAR control funds that actually will begin selling their positions and equities based on the gamma effect of, of accumulation of volatility. The first wave of selling might be driven by technical factors. The second wave of selling then is driven by algorithmic framework of these, these larger implicit vol funds selling based on VAR accumulation and correlation breakdowns. That will lead to the explicit short vol players having to cover positions that they established back when the market was down just a little bit you know, on the, the last position. And this can cascade into a very violent cycle. Now, so I want to just take push back on This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 102 was recorded January 25th, 2018. I'm Eric Townsend. Artemis Capital founder Chris Cole will be joining me as this week's feature interview guest, and you're not going to want to miss this one, folks. Chris is one of the most informed voices in the industry when it comes to equity volatility, and he's going to put the short vol trade that you've heard so much about in a whole new light. 
Be sure not to miss Chris's chart book. The download is available in your Research Roundup email. Be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment after the feature interview when Patrick and I will compare notes on trading strategies that benefit from Chris Cole's outlook for equity volatility. And I'm Patrick Serezna. Now, Eric, the S&P 500 once again this week ripped to all-time new highs and has been sort of consolidating since. Uh, what's your take here on the markets? Well, you know, it's been more than 24 hours since we had a new all-time high. Is that a new record? <laughs> Is that the new rules these days? I don't really see this much differently than what I've described for the last several weeks. We're in the late stages of a bull market. One thing I would say, I've seen a lot of people on Twitter that are getting kind of befuddled about, you know, how come the RSI is at this number and it didn't hold and whatever. Remember that if I'm right and we are in that final euphoria stage of a bull market, that's when technical analysis tends to go out the window and it's really just sentiment and momentum that takes over. The market keeps going up because people many times first time investors are rushing in fear of missing out syndrome and it just takes things higher regardless of what the RSI or any other technical indicator might be doing. I don't think that I would want to be long or short this market right now. If you're going to play the upside or the downside, I'd do it with options because I think we're in that very, very difficult to time stage where there could be another thousand points points of upside on the S&P, or it could roll over tomorrow and there could be a tragic event to the downside. It's a question of when the catalyst comes along to change investor sentiment. We don't have it yet, but you never know what might happen. So I think the key is play it with options. And for anyone who might have missed it, you did an excellent webinar. I had time this past weekend to tune in, quite enjoyed that. For anybody who missed it, they can go to bigpicturetrading.com and it's still possible, I think, to get the playback of the webinar that you did on the ratio call spread, which is an excellent way if you want to play this market to the upside to use options in order to manage your downside risk. All right, let's move on. Now, you wanted to do things a little differently this week because you wanted to combine the outlook on the dollar, gold, and treasury bonds all into a single topic. Now, the dollar index was holding that 90 level, and when that support line gave, uh, we dropped almost two full points down to the towards the bottom end of 88 in very short order. I mean, there was so very heavy selling on the dollar. What's on your mind there? Well, I wanted to take the three of these things together because they're interrelated in a very complex way, and I'll be the first to admit that I don't fully understand what the heck is going on right now. First of all, I've been predicting for months on this program that if we saw a clean downside break below 91 on the dollar index, that it would accelerate to the downside. Now, needless to say, when the Treasury Secretary of the United States announces to the world that a weak dollar is a good thing, that certainly helps it to the downside. Of course, now President Trump came out today and said that uh, Mr. Mnuchin was misunderstood and misinterpreted that the low U.S. dollar is a good thing. That didn't really mean it or something. I'm not sure. The point is, you see this kind of downside acceleration on the dollar. What I was predicting was that gold would take off to the upside. The other thing is, of course, there's a relationship between treasury yields and the dollar. What you would expect is that if treasury yields were going to trend to the downside in yield up in price, that would tend to support a weak dollar situation. On the other hand, if treasury yields are increasing in yield, that attracts international capital, and that should be supportive of the U.S. dollar. So it doesn't really make sense to have treasury yields going up at the same time as the dollar is going down. Now, for years, I've been predicting that exact scenario of treasury yields up and dollar down as a signpost to indicate that we're really in the end game for the U.S. dollar. But frankly, if that's what were going on, you would see just massive upside in gold as everybody was panicking out of the dollar. So what's really perplexing to me, Patrick, is first of all, the move in the dollar doesn't really jibe with the move that we've seen now up to, I think it was, a, I don't know what the high yield was. I don't think we hit 2.7%, but certainly 267, 268, I think I saw on the 10-year yield this week. That's a pretty steep yield to have the dollar collapsing. And the thing is, gold, yeah, it's up, but it's not up by very much. And once President Trump said, don't take the Secretary of the Treasury seriously when he says a weak dollar is a good thing, gold sold right off, back down to pretty close to where it was last week. So if the dollar is 
tanking the way it appears to be and is headed much lower, why the heck isn't gold higher? And how do we reconcile what's going on with treasuries? My contention, Patrick, is something doesn't add up here. We're seeing a false signal somewhere.